Well, good morning. It's so wonderful to look out and see each and every face here today. Good to have you. Good to be together in the body of Christ. Amen? If you're traveling and you've come in, or maybe you're here for the season, or maybe you live in Vero and this is your first time here at Vero Bible Fellowship, we just want to welcome you and hope you feel right at home and that you enjoy the Word of God that we begin to study today. This is, you know, we're going to have a barbecue later, a chicken dinner. It's going to be a special time. After that, we're going to have a pie auction, raise money for the youth group, and eat some phenomenal pie. But I'm telling you this morning, none of that stuff will feed your spirit. Only the Word will feed your spirit. So we're going to get into the Word, and thank you, Brenton, for reading for us, Pastor Brenton, the, the text for the day. Last week was a very unique and special Sunday when we were blessed to have Isaac Shaw and his wife Gloria with us from Southeast Asia, where they have a ministry, and what a phenomenal message he proclaimed as he shared the gospel of Christ with us. What I found so, so moving, well, first of all, there were so many wonderful tidbits and, and nuggets of truth that he shared with us, but at the close of the service, someone who was here received the Lord. They got saved. So praise God for that, huh? God is so good, and uh, we are so thankful that each week we can open His Word, hear the gospel, and know that people in this room can be transformed by Christ. I believe that with all my heart. I don't care who you are, where you've been, what you've done. Uh, God is greater than your sin, and Jesus has gone further to save you from your sin. And Today you can be saved. I uh, want us to pray before we get into the Word, and let's remember Pastor Ray Garcia. Uh, Pastor Ray had an outpatient surgery this, late this week, and uh, they really went in and did some significant work. It's something that he's lingered and had going on for a number of years, and uh, so the doctor was trying to help him by taking out some things that didn't need to be in there. I don't know. I, I, I got a lot of things in here that need to go, but uh, maybe I need some surgery. I don't know. But uh, uh, he's in a lot of pain right now, and uh, we need to really lift him up uh, because of the extensive work that they did while they were in cleaning him out. So we pray that, uh, that you'll lift Pastor Ray, continue to pray for him, but let's do that right now. Father, we just give you thanks that your, your, your word is real, your word is life. Jesus, you said if you know it, it'll set you free. And so today we come to learn like little hungry children sitting at a table ready for our Father to deliver up the meal. And we're thankful, Lord, that this meal leads to eternal life. It, it gives us strength to live that life of sanctification every day, being conformed to the image of Jesus. We lift up, Lord, those in the body who are suffering and hurting those who cannot be with us this morning, uh, just comfort them, minister to them, touch them, Lord. We lift up Pastor Ray to you, Lord, and continue as the elders have been praying for him, but we pray that you would cause the pain to subside, that he would begin to see a turnaround today, even this morning in the hospital, and he would be released and he can come home. And Lord, we just pray that you'd bless him and that in this time of great need, that, Lord, you would meet him. That's what you told us. You said that the veil of the tent was ripped from the top to the bottom to signify that we can now boldly come before the throne of grace and receive help in our time of need. And so, Lord, provide that, we pray for our dear brother. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Well, this week we return to Acts 9 where we see the power of a conversion. It's, it's, it's the... Uh, what we would know as the Apostle Paul, but really he is Saul also. Some people think that his name changed after he was saved. That's not true. He's all, he was always Saul, and he was always Paul. Saul would have been his Jewish name, but he was also a Roman citizen because his father purchased citizenship, which was, by the way, in that day unheard of. You had to put up a lot of money to be uh, to given Roman citizenship. So Paul was also a Roman citizen, and that's where his name Paul would come into play. If you want to know where that transition took place, 
Some people believe that transition happened during his salvation. It did not. You're going to see today he's referred to even after his salvation as Saul. The name change happened when his ministry that God had ordained and blessed him with began. He was going to be a minister to the Gentile world. Well, he changed his name to Paul, a Gentile name, in order to minister to the Gentiles. Or at least that's what the Gentile world recognized him by his name Paul, more than Saul. So that's just a little background on that. But interestingly, there has never been a dramatic shift in someone's life that I've ever heard about or read anywhere like what Saul experienced with Jesus on the road to Damascus. Saul's life was turned inside out, upside down. He, he was hit by the gospel of Jesus Christ. You might say he was apprehended. I would say he was arrested by God. God came calling and Saul heard the voice of God speak audibly. Even the men, his, his entourage that were traveling with him to go and arrest Christians in Damascus, even they heard a voice. They didn't understand what the voice was saying, but they heard it as this bright light, brighter than the noonday sun, literally, because it was 12 noon when it happened. And the sun was shining brightly that day. And yet, this light was far brighter than the sun. And it stopped Saul in his tracks. It was a six-day journey from Jerusalem up to uh, Damascus. And, uh, and it was towards the end of that journey. The, the, the passage, the Scripture says that he was almost in Damascus when this event occurred. And it literally knocked him down. This is a dramatic seizure where God is taking control of a man's life. He is calling him unto salvation, and Saul didn't hesitate. He was smart enough to know that there is a God. He thought he knew who God was through the religion of Judaism, but was completely arrested and came to understand that Jesus whom he was persecuting is, in fact, the second person of the Trinity. He is God, and his life was never the same. Let's quickly review Saul's experience beginning at, at Acts chapter 9, verse 1. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. By the way, this event did not happen that long after Saul had been standing where the men were throwing their coats down so they could stone Stephen, the first Christian martyr. Many have been taught to believe that he was simply a young guy who was standing over to the side watching, and that was the pivotal moment that really launched him into this all-out attack on Christianity. I beg to differ. The passage says that Stephen was speaking with the Jerusalem leaders, and they could not defeat him as he contended for the faith in Jesus Christ, using the same Old Testament passages that they were using, but bringing the picture to fruition, showing the revelation that Jesus is God and they could not refute him. I believe Saul was right there on the scene. Saul was raised up and trained by the greatest scholar, rabbi of that day, Gamaliel. And he was taught everything. Gamaliel once said in a Jewish historian, is the one who records this, that he, the only frustration he had with Saul as a young boy coming up, being taught, what it is to be a rabbi, was that I could never keep enough information in front of him. He, whatever I gave him to read, he devoured it. Saul was that kind of a student, and now he's an adult, now he's there. Here we see that Saul is the one who goes to the Jerusalem leadership and, and receives a letter 
allowing him to travel to Damascus and arrest Christians. Saul is not just a boy standing by the side watching the stoning of Stephen. I believe he probably was the instigator who helped get the crowd riled up to go after Stephen. If you don't believe it, if you go back to Acts chapter 8, verse 1, go back just one chapter, it says, And Saul approved of his execution. Whose execution? Stephen's. Saul approved of this. Well, what does it matter if Saul approves or not, if he's just a boy standing by watching? It matters because Saul was one of the instigators. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles, which is a fulfillment of what Christ said. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and ultimately to the ends of the earth. Verse 2 in chapter 8, a verse, uh, chapter 8, it says, Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church. You don't go from being a boy standing on the sideline watching to now ravaging the church. In the Greek, the word ravage is a reference or the idea of a wolf who captures a sheep and begins to tear and rip the flesh. That's Paul's intent, is to ravage the church. It goes even further. And entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Dragging off, it's the same Greek word used when it speaks of the disciples dragging in their net filled to the brim with fish. Literally grabbing that net. I don't know if you've ever used a cast net. Some of you have because you're fishermen. I grew up in Daytona Beach, and we had a shrimp run through the, through the, uh, uh, the intercoastal waterway once a year. And my dad and I, where's my dad? Dad, are you here? Are you in church today, Dad? There he is, right there. Okay. We would go out in our boat, and he would throw a 12-foot cast net. And he would throw that thing down to the, to the floor of the channel, and we would bring up these beautiful shrimp, man, and load up and go home and have shrimp, have a shrimp fry. Man, you talk about good. That was some good eating. But he had to drag this net up, and when it was filled with shrimp, it became heavy, so heavy that he could only throw so many times, and he was wore out. Think about dragging a net. This is how Paul approached believers. He literally would grab them and he would drag them out of their homes, kicking and screaming if necessary, in order to bring them to persecution. Let me give you an accurate picture of Saul in today's society. Because I just think it's important to see the, the beauty, the glory of the salvation of the, of the Apostle Paul you have to put it in terms that you can understand. In today's society, okay, think of a legislator bent on passing law to arrest and imprison pastors and Christian leaders who preach against sin. Maybe even a bill that they call a hate speech bill, simply for proclaiming the truth that's found in the Bible. Think about a legislator who is out to sign a bill in Congress that would immediately ban any and all Christian life in America. No public radio broadcast any longer. No use of any public forum, social media platform. Completely shutting down. If you are found to be a believer, they come and they drag you off to prison, that kind of law being passed. Paul, by the way, knew the law inside and out. He was a Pharisee. That means he had memorized the Pentateuch at the least. The entire first five books of the Old Testament he memorized. He probably memorized all of the Old Testament. He knew the law inside and out. If anybody could apply the law for the purposes of gain or for the purposes of his own uh, demise, he could do it, and he did it. 
He has a letter to haul Christians to prison. This is who Saul would be today. He would be the guy that we as the church would fear. We would be praying, Lord, please stop this man. Keep this man from coming. Keep him from passing these laws. This is who Saul is. Much later in Acts chapter 22. Turn, if you will, just quickly. In Acts 22, verse 4, at least write down the verse. If you're a Bible student, you, you want to have the verse, Acts 22, 4. Paul said, I persecuted this way, capital W-A-Y. The way was the reference that the world used to refer to followers of Jesus. Because Jesus made the claim, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man goes to the Father except through me. And so, so it says here, I persecuted this way to the death. It wasn't enough that Christians just simply don't speak about your beliefs. Just don't speak about it. No, no. If you are a Christian, you need to die. You need to be put in prison. We need to haul you off. You should not be part of society. And binding and delivering to prison both men and women. He didn't care who you were. In Acts 26, verse 10, Paul said, And I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. So he had authority from the chief priests. He could actually cast a vote one way or the other. Verse 11, and I punished them often in all the synagogues, and I tried to make them blaspheme. And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. This is Saul. This is his life. He is the opposite, the antithesis of a Christ follower. He is the one who persecutes Christ followers. What a guy. What a guy. If all you knew of Saul was that I uh, what I just read to you, you would never in a million years expect this guy to get saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ. It would literally have to be God who would turn him around. And by the way, that is the only way any human being is saved. If God does the saving. You cannot save yourself. You can make yourself religious. You can fit into Christian circles, talk the talk, sing the songs, give some money. But really all you are is a possibly good moral person. This is the problem that I see within many Christians' lives who have, who have attached themselves so deeply to some political party. I'm a Republican. I'm a conservative. But I don't live my life for the Republican Party. Because many of those in the Republican Party are just religious at best. They absolutely have a morality, I believe, that the Democrat Party as a whole doesn't project. And if you're a Democrat... I pray for you every day. No, I'm just... If there, is, there is something going on in these political parties. I've never seen them so isolated, so against one another. But I can tell you right now, I don't spend my day working for the Republican Party. I am called to spend my day sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with people on both sides of the aisle. I don't care who they are. That's the goal. Amen? Amen? So I'm not saying you shouldn't have a, a patriotism to our country. Everybody that's American should. I should I'm not saying that you shouldn't uh, position yourself so that you know all the issues and you vote for the person who is best for this nation. All that's important. But that shouldn't be your life. When things don't go your way in the political system, you shouldn't miss a beat going out the next day sharing Christ with people. 
Because life goes on with God regardless of who's sitting in the office of president. We're seeing that right now, aren't we? Uh, Believe me, I'm not losing any sleep over it. There's a job to be done. There's work to be done in the kingdom. Amen? Every day. Be part of it. Be part of it. No excuses. What would keep Saul from, from coming to Christ? Well, three things. One, wealth. His family was wealthy. In regard to wealth, Jesus said, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Wealth has a tendency to insulate us from a need for God. We become so so, uh, taken by the physical realm, and wealth can feed that, that we never pay attention to the spiritual darkness. And that's why Jesus said it. I mean, look, Jesus said it. I'm not the one. He said it. Not a whole lot of rich folk are going to be in heaven. That's his thing. I didn't say it. So Paul had that going against him because his family had money. Secondly, education. He studied under Gamaliel, the greatest rabbi. After his conversion, Paul would reach back into his vast knowledge of culture and history and speak to the philosophers at the Areopagus in Greece where he would quote the Greek scholars verbatim. This man understood the days that he lived in. He was highly educated. Yet later in his life, Paul said, knowledge makes arrogant. What he meant by that, not all knowledge, he's saying if you have information but you don't know how to use wisdom with that information, you don't have wisdom with that information, it's going to just puff you up. And so there was, because he was so highly educated, there was an arrogance to him. There was a puffiness to him. He never truly gave Christ the attention that he deserved because he thought he was already right in what he believed. Thirdly, religion. Saul was the most promising of all young men in Judaism. By pedigree, he had rabbi written all over him. In, first, in Philippians chapter 3, verse 5, it says, He was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee. You can't go any higher than being a Pharisee of the law. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, he was blameless. If there was any moral, morally right person, it would have been Saul. In other words, if salvation is based on good religious works, Saul would be the first in line because he was blameless. But religion cannot save anyone. Listen to what Paul said in his letter to Titus. He said in Titus 3, 4, he gives a clear teaching on what saves a person. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by His grace we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. It's all God, Paul said. Salvation is totally the work of God. So he had to overcome these things. The message of the gospel is that God has the power to transform lives. I believe that. I've seen it with my own eyes. I have watched it from a distance as others are being saved. It's real. But it's not just by experience that I know that. I know it from the Word of God, looking no further than the life of Saul. I pray that today, if you are here and you are not saved, I pray that as God comes calling, as He calls upon you for salvation, that you will not resist it. You will not be too proud because you think you know so much. You will not allow money to keep you from coming under the one who created all things, and in him all things are held together. But that you would fall to your knees in a spiritual sense, and you would allow Christ to take full ownership of your life, and you would surrender to him today. And today walk out of this place transformed by the powerful work of the Holy Spirit. 
no longer the same person, totally new. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. The old stuff, it passes away. Behold, all things become new. That's the prayer that we have today. And as God's church, we need to remember that. There's no excuse for a follower of Jesus and a member of Vero Bible Fellowship to not open our mouths every day and share the gospel with people. Every day. We need to spend time each morning in His Word and on our knees asking God to give us opportunities to share His name, to share His message with people who, who do not know Him. By the way, I'm not saying force anything on anyone. I'm not talking about some kind of a belligerent, obnoxious approach. I'm talking about looking for opportunities to do one thing. Jesus said, you're to broadcast the seed. What's the seed? The Word of God, the, the, the truth of the gospel. You just throw the seed. You might just be throwing seed on somebody who totally rejects it. Somebody else who's thinking about God, but they're not really sure, and you throw a little more seed. They don't get saved, but God just used you. Or maybe it's the one who is ready. And man, that seed comes up and brings a beautiful crop of beautiful fruit because you were willing to speak the gospel of Christ to them. I've had that happen where, you know, it's been tough. I was traveling to Honduras uh, for a missions trip, and I was on the airplane, seated in the back of the plane. Uh, what was the name of that airline? Anybody travel to Honduras? It used to be called like Taka or something. I don't know. Anyway, so I'm in the back of this plane, man, and it is jam-packed with people. And this, this, this attendant comes down the aisle, and she said, uh, is there any person who, would be, who's, who has an empty seat next to them, and I think there were like three or four of us, that would, you would be willing to move? And Now, you're, you have an empty seat. You've got a little space between you and the next person. If you're willing to move and, and let a mother and her mother sit there, I just jumped right up. I said, yeah, I'll do it. So I thought, okay, they're going to put me in one of these empty chairs with somebody else. No big deal. And... Uh, they didn't. The lady said, come with me. Took me up to first class. <laughs> this is back when they had first class, you know. These big wide seats, you know. And it's, man, are you kidding me? I'm sitting up there. They set me down next to this guy. Uh, I, I cannot for the life of me now remember his name. I want to say it was Pedro, but I'm not really sure. But this guy was about 45 years old, and he was a Honduran. And I sat down. I pulled my Bible out just began to read. And he said, what are you reading? I said, I'm reading the Bible. He goes, oh. He said, you know, when I was in the university, there were these students who were traveling around through the university and passing out these little booklets about the Bible, about Christianity. He goes, can you tell me a little bit about it? <laughs> hey, reach in that seed bag, <laughs> threw some seed on it, and... Uh, Pedro received Jesus Christ on that airplane. He was ready. He was hungry. I didn't have to do anything except just open my mouth and just speak about the gospel of Christ. That's all I did. Somebody else had planted seeds somewhere way back, probably those booklets way back when he was in the university. That man got saved that day on that airplane. I wasn't even supposed to sit by him. See, it was a God-appointed time. So you don't know how God's going to use you. Just be willing to let God use you. Okay? What's it called, Julian, the airplane? Taco. Taco. Okay. There we go. See, I wasn't far off. Okay. You guys thought I was kidding, but we're, that's real stuff. Okay. So, verse 3 in our text. I want to make four points quickly. What does it mean when a pastor says he's going to go quick? Nothing. No, it, it'll be sooner than you think. Okay, so, see, here's the thing. The church should never forget these important truths. When I say church, I'm not talking about a sign. I'm not talking about a location. I'm talking about the people of God who have been called to Vero Bible Fellowship. I'm talking about individuals here. We should never forget these things. Number one, no one is so lost that God cannot find them. No one. No one is so lost that God cannot find them. God can save anybody no matter how far they are from Him. That's why you never stop praying for them. That's why you never stop speaking each day. He can save Saul. He can save your loved one. 
He can save your work associate. He can reach anybody. Look at verse 3. Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. That's exactly how it happens. You don't see it coming. You're moving through life. You're on mission, doing whatever it is you think is so important in life. And suddenly, without warning, God breaks through your self-centered existence, and he apprehends you. He arrests you. Suddenly, the light of his glory breaks through the darkness of your self-righteousness. It's like the sinner who only attends church on Easter Sunday, and suddenly, the light comes on. The skeptic who made a hobby out of arguing with Christians, and I know an atheist who made, here in Vero Beach who made a life out of arguing with Christians and trying to get them to blaspheme. You want to know his name? Louis Trope. How many of you know Louis? Raise a hand. Louis is the head of the jail here in Vero Beach. He's, a, he's now the chaplain. Isn't that amazing? This guy was an atheist. He would go through Publix in the line and see a Christian say something. Praise God. Hallelujah. Oh, yeah. And he would just, get, and Louis's a sharp guy. And he would just get under their skin. And now Louis Trope is a Christian serving the Lord in the prison system. Praise God. The professor who mocks the faith of his Christian students. And suddenly, there, there was a professor here. I knew his mother very well. She was a godly saint, a prayer warrior. And he was a professor over at Indian River State College. And he would literally make fun of the Christian students when they would speak of their faith. One time, a young man who was part of our church, who was in his class, they were, he was making a point, laughing at Christians. And this young man stood and said, Sir, I am a Christian. And he just looked at him and started laughing, the whole class laughing at him. And he held his ground. He said, I expected that kind of a response if you don't know who Jesus really is. And he continued to be in that class, and he continued to do this. Guess what? Suddenly, that professor got saved. This is how the Lord works. Nobody is so far gone that God cannot reach them and save them. Verse 4, in failing, or I'm sorry, in falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Jesus is calling Saul by name. Jesus knows your name. You're here today. You're unsaved. He knows you. Saul, why are you persecuting me? Jesus takes it personal when one of his own is being persecuted. When you persecute a Christian, you are persecuting Jesus Christ. Saul said, who are you, Lord? Look at that, calling him Lord. Because he knows whoever this is, he is far more powerful than me. He is God. And Jesus gave the answer, I am. You think it's Jesus. It, no, it's I am. That's who he is. He is the great I am. And then he put the name that Paul would recognize, Jesus, whom you are persecuting. He's saying, I'm the guy you, appro you approved of people stoning to death. I'm the family you chased out of their home and threw into prison. I'm the guy you tried to legislate against. I'm the group that you're traveling to Damascus to arrest right now. Christian, you are never alone when you are facing persecution. Jesus is with you. They aren't really persecuting you. They're persecuting him, trying to. They can't, but that's what they're, they're wanting to hurt him. You just happen to be in the way because you're standing for him. Verse 5, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, but rise and enter the city and you will be told what you are to do. By the way, salvation has already happened in Saul. The second that he called him Lord, he was surrendered. And so, rise and go to the city and then I'll tell you what to do. 
In an instant, Jesus is convicting Saul of his sin. He's transforming his life from here forward. Paul, Saul would defend and proclaim the, to the death the transforming power of the gospel of Jesus Christ that he tried to persecute. He was confronted, he was convicted, he was converted, and he was conformed. All in an instant. That's what salvation is. A complete 180 turn. If you've never experienced that, if you just simply started going to church and kind of hanging out with people and liking the church, I like what the church stands for, I like the way that guy speaks, I like that worship, that song, that music, you're just religious at that point. I'm not getting on you for it, I'm just telling you that's what you are. You need to be saved. There needs to be a suddenly in your life where you surrender to God and allow God to save you. So number one, no one is lost, so lost that God cannot find them. Number two, no one is so hard that God cannot break them. This is the key to a transformed life. What is brokenness? Look at verse 7. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand. Here's a man who was in complete control of his life, looked up to by the Jews. And now he's being led by the hand because he can't see where he's going. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days, he was without sight and he did not eat or drink. Now the breaking begins in Saul's life. He was standing. Now he's kneeling. He was leading, now he needs to be led. He was in control, now he's under the control of Jesus Christ. He was on his way to seize others, he has now been seized by Jesus Christ. You talk about a transformed life. God was able to humble those who walk proudly. Just ask King Nebuchadnezzar, just ask Jonah, just ask Peter. I don't care who you are, God can break you. You can be as hard as you think and nobody can get to you. If God reaches you with the gospel, if he turns the light on, let me tell you something. The only response, look, desperate people are not picky. When people truly want help, they don't, they don't make demands. Paul's the one who said, I am a slave to Jesus Christ. What was he saying? He's essentially saying, I don't have any rights anymore. I don't own myself any longer. We pride ourselves as Americans because we are in a wonderful uh, constitution. We have a wonderful constitution. And it's a constitutional republic. And, and, and we believe in self-governing. That's wonderful. As an American, but not as a Christian, as a Christian, you're no better than Paul, a slave to Jesus Christ, willing to let Christ have complete control. No one is so lost that God cannot find. No one is so hard that God cannot break. No one, thirdly, is so wicked that Christ cannot redeem. Look at verse 10. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias... And he said, here I am, Lord. Look at that. The same words. And he's, a, he's, he's a Christian. The same words that Paul used. Who are you, Lord? Here he says, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is, what's he doing? Praying. Complete turnaround. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. Ananias couldn't see Saul being transformed by Christ. This guy's too far gone, Lord. This guy's a, he, he's ravaging the church. But see, God didn't see a problem. God saw an opportunity. He reached Saul with the gospel. This man is no longer the same guy. 
Ananias thought Saul was too far gone. He's too wicked. He's too irredeemable. But no one is so wicked that Christ cannot redeem them. You ever heard of the name K. Arthur? If you're a lady and you're a Christian, most certainly you probably have heard of K. Arthur. Before she came to Jesus Christ, before she surrendered her life, she was hard. K. Arthur was a, is a self-confessed, or was, not now, was a self-confessed harlot. That's what she called herself, a harlot. She was searching for love by sleeping around with various men. Even had a two-year relationship with a married man. Who is K. Arthur? She's the founder of Precept Bible Studies, Precept Ministries. She has ministered to more women and led them out of bondage and darkness by teaching them how to study the Bible inductively and how to find truth that transforms a former harlot, a former adulteress, and yet God has, has used her throughout her life mightily. It doesn't matter what you think of yourself. The only thing that matters is what God thinks of you. It doesn't matter what others say about you. It only matters what God says about you. Mickey Evans, where's Michael? Michael, you know who I'm talking about. You and Peggy both. Mickey Evans, the founder of Dunklin Memorial Camp, out west of Stewart, Florida, here just down south. They've built cities of refuge all over the world. Mickey Evans, God called him to be a Baptist preacher. That lasted for a short time. He said, Lord, if this is what it's all about, I don't want any part of it. The Lord said, I didn't call you to be a pastor in a, in a Baptist church. I called you to go work with alcoholics and drug addicts. So he took him out in the middle of nowhere in cow pasture, and they started Dunklin Memorial Camp, a 12-month residential program for guys who are addicted to drugs and alcohol. And Mickey spent his life, the rest of his life, ministering there. If you go in the cafeteria, you walk in, and you walk up to get in the line there to go get your food, and on the wall right there on the right side as you're walking up, there are all these pictures of men and their families. And these are men who used to be drug addicts and alcoholics, completely down and out, many destined for death, yet the Lord didn't save them. And now they've got these smiles, and their families are smiling. And in big words, over top of the pictures, jewels from the devil's junk pile. Isn't that awesome? That's what God can do. That's what God can do. Mickey was just a man who knew and believed that God could transform anybody if the person was willing to surrender their life to God. It doesn't matter what you think about yourself. It doesn't matter what you think about that other person. It's what God thinks about them. You need to join God in that. Just spread the seed. Be faithful. Love them. Reach them. Verse 15, but the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. This is the calling that God is going to give Paul after now he's been transformed. I want you to go and let this man know that he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and children of Israel. And look what else it says. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. Friends, I want to tell you something. Do not sit under, listen to any preacher who pushes a prosperity gospel. It is nowhere in the Bible. It is of Satan. Every believer will suffer for Jesus Christ. You know what Peter said? Peter said, what do you mean you're a Christian and you're not persecuted? It's not even possible. If you're a believer in Christ, you will face persecution. You will face suffering. Paul, here's your calling. Here's what I'm going to do in you. I'm going to raise you up and you're going to go reach the Gentile world. And you're going to suffer many things for my name's sake as you do it. Wow, thanks. Who would sign up for that? What a plan. Saved, transformed, and now I'm going to suffer. Listen, Christian. 
Every one of us are in that same boat. How are you suffering for Christ? I'm not saying going out and trying to induce suffering. I'm just saying by being faithful to love people the way God loves people and throw the seed and know that as you throw it, some are going to reject it. Others are even going to come back at you. That's persecution. It's a very mild form of persecution, but it's persecution. You might even lose a job over it. That's still mild compared to losing your life. There are brothers and sisters in Christ around the globe. They're losing their lives because they are willing to suffer for Christ. Look at number four, last point. No one can be transformed without the support of a church family. First, we said no one is so lost that God can't find them. Secondly, no one is so hard that God cannot break them. Thirdly, no one is so wicked that Christ cannot redeem them. Number four, no one can be transformed without the support of a church family. I'm not saying by that that the church is what transforms a person. I'm saying that as God transforms you, you need the support of the body of Jesus Christ. God's the one who, by the way, created the church for that purpose. Church was never designed to be the worship, a bunch of sinners worshiping. Well, who would they worship? If they're sinners, they're not going to worship the one true God. The church is made up of Christians. Now, we invite sinners because we used to be one, right? right? Nobody here is better than any sinner. But when they come to church, they ought to see the body, the beauty of the believer worshiping God. And no one can be transformed without the support of that. Verse 17, so Ananias departed and entered the house and laying hands on him, he said, brother Saul, look at that. He goes from thinking this guy can't be turned around and now he says he calls him brother. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized. And taking food, he was strengthened. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus. He remained right there with the Christians in Damascus, the ones that he was supposed to haul off in prison. And now here he is. He's with them. They are ministering to him. God has orchestrated that the church be the delivery system of the gospel to the world. But it's also the place to receive those who are saved that they might grow in Christ Jesus. That's what we're called to. We don't judge people when they come through that door. We just love people. The saving is God's work, not ours. And the judging is not the way God works. God never cleans a fish until he catches it. So why are you trying to clean fish before they're caught? Shouldn't we just focus on just loving people and let God do the cleaning? Verse 20, and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues, saying, he is the son of God, the one that I thought was a joke, and I needed to persecute all these people pushing his name. Now I know him personally to be God. He's the son of God. And he proved it by the scripture in the Old Testament. And all who heard him were amazed and said, is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of these who called upon his name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? And, but Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. How could he do that? By the Old Testament that they followed. He revealed the parts that they didn't understand that spoke of Jesus, Messiah. Verse 23, and when many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him, but their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him, but his disciples took him by night and led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. Those who were now walking with Saul as he was ministering from the church in Damascus. Now he has a group that God has surrounded him with, and now because they're trying to kill him, these guys come alongside, the church comes alongside and lowers him down in a basket so he can escape the city. Because God has great plans for this man. You say, what are the great plans? What's so great? Let me hear about this. He's going to suffer <laughs> for Jesus. We should be familiar with that. We should be familiar with suffering. There should have been somebody in the room that said, Amen, because you understand it. And I know there are those of you who do, but that's your life. That's who it is. 
Christian is a sufferer. Verse 28, so he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. This is what transformed people do. They boldly proclaim Jesus. Why? Because they've been saved. They've been redeemed. The idea of redemption is a picture of somebody who's a slave, and they're on the slave trade block at a slave market, and they're standing there. They're waiting for somebody to bid on them, to be somebody's slave. And this guy comes up through the crowd who were there to buy a slave. And he says, I'll buy him. And Satan says to this one guy, you don't want to buy him. It'll cost you everything to buy him. And he said, yeah, I do want to buy him. And he went to the cross, and he surrendered his life. He shed his blood that he might, through his death, burial, and resurrection, save you and give you a transformed life. Every one of us were on that slave block. And if you're not a Christian, you're still on it. You say, I'm not a slave. Yes, you are. You're a slave to sin. Paul said that. Why would he say it? Because he understands it. He was a slave to sin. And now God's saying, I'm calling you to be a slave to righteousness. Be a slave of Jesus Christ. Take on his yoke, because his yoke is easier. His burden is light. Let him minister to you. Let him comfort you. Let him strengthen you. Let him position you, empower you to be a witness so that you can endure for his name's sake on this earth. Let's pray. Father, this morning we just give you thanks that you are a God who understands every single heart in this room. You know where each of us really are. You know those in the room that are like uh, the soil that had a bunch of rocks on it. And when the seed fell on the rocks, it only went so deep. At first they were so excited to receive the message of the gospel, but then over time the seed couldn't go deeper. It couldn't develop a, strength, a strong, healthy root system, and it basically died out. They never were saved, even though for a moment it looked like they might have been saved. Or the person who is like that hard, packed ground, the path, their heart is hardened. And when the seed falls on it, it can't even break through the soil. And so the birds come along and just... They pick up the seed right off the surface. It just doesn't settle. That's the person who goes home today and they say, oh, what was that all about? Or then there's a person whose heart is like that weed. It's the seed reaches the weeds. And at first it grabs a little bit of soil, is able to come forth, but then the weeds begin to crowd it out. And Jesus made it clear the weeds are the cares of this world. And when somebody hears that they're a Christian, they say, oh, uh, no, not me. They deny Christ because they're not really saved. But he said, some of the seed will fall upon fertile soil. And that seed will go down into that soil and it will bring forth a fruit. Some 30, 60, 90 fold. God, may we be a church of fertile soil. And may we go out and may we throw the seed and may that seed fall on all kinds of soil and us not become deterred or disillusioned by what soil the seed hits. But Lord, may we just be faithful to be a good sower. And every once in a while, the timing is right, God is reaching, and that person surrenders. And we get a front row seat to salvation. I pray that, that we would be that faithful people in Jesus' name. If you're here today and you're not a believer, but understanding the gospel, that Christ died for you, you have to simply recognize that you're a sinner, you repent, 
you think differently. Saul used to think Jesus was not the way, the truth, the life. And then all of a sudden, he saw him as God. That's what you have to do. You have to see him for who he is. And then by faith, you reach out. Lord, I receive you as you come calling for me today. In an instant, immediately, you're saved. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to raise a hand. You don't have to walk an aisle. We don't have to sing a song. It just happens because you opened your heart and you received him. I pray that's you today. In Jesus' name. God bless you, church.